So today we're going to be talking about careers in nutrition and specifically what it is that a dietitian does. So what is nutrition? The word nutrition can have a few different meanings. As you can see up here, um, nutrition encompasses not only the nutritive value of foods, but also how those nutrients are metabolized within your body. When we look at nutrition, nutrients provide our body with the basic building blocks we need for everyday functioning. So food is basically fuel for your body. But oftentimes, people don't think of food as being fuel. We think of it as an enjoyment and entertainment piece. When we look at food and break it down even more, there's macronutrients and there's micronutrients. Macronutrients are things like carbohydrates, fat, and protein. And that's what fuels our body and gives us the basic building blocks that I was talking about. So depending on your stage of life, depending on different factors going on inside of your body, you're gonna need a different amount of those three key macronutrients. And that's gonna differ for each person. So if you don't have enough of those macronutrients, you're looking at malnutrition. And if you have too much of those macronutrients, then we're looking at the excess calories being stored as fat in your body, which leads to weight gain. Then we can break it down even further where we have micronutrients. Micronutrients are things like vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, fiber, all of those types of things. So I won't go into too much detail on that for you today. I just wanted to give you a quick um, background on what nutrition is. When we look at the nutritional needs for different people, like I mentioned earlier, throughout the lifespan, your nutrition needs are going to change based on your physiological changes within the body and also based on your activity levels. So it's going to be different at every stage of life what you actually need to get from your food. Nutrition can optimize your health, prevent disease, and also treat any condition or disease that you may have. The amount of nutrition that someone receives and what the foods they choose is based on your economic, physiological, social, and cultural factors. So there's a lot of different factors that play into the nutrients that we receive and the nutrients that we need. So what does a registered dietitian do? Well, dietitians can help you decipher between a healthy and an unhealthy choice so that the food please don't lock you up. That's just a joke, and I don't have that, that great of a sense of humor, so that's all you're going to get from me for jokes today. <laughs> but dietitians are just out there to help you make the healthiest choice you can and receive the maximum nutritional benefit from the foods that you do choose. So let's talk a little bit about what a registered dietitian is. Today, with a better understanding about the relationship between good eating habits and good health, Dietitians are playing an increasingly larger role and a more important role contributing to the health and well-being of all Canadians. Registered Dietitian is abbreviated as RD here in Manitoba. Healthcare professionals who are trained and provide um, advice about diet, nutrition, and food. We use science, um, we use a science of nutrition and evidence-based um, science to support our healthy decision choices and our healthy eating choices that we recommend to clients and to the communities. Um, we influence policy development, direct nutrition programs, manage quality services, and we also conduct nutrition research. So many of you may have heard the word nutritionist before and also the word dietitian. So I wanted to quickly take a second to decipher between those two. When we look at a dietitian and a nutritionist, they can be the same thing, but in most cases they are not. A registered dietitian will use your knowledge and our skills in food and nutrition to promote good health. A nutritionist may do that as well. The major difference is that to be a registered dietitian, you have to have a bachelor's degree, you have to have completed specialized training, and then you have to be registered with a regulatory body in your province. So um, there's no regulatory standards for a nutritionist to practice under, and they will not be covered under a law. Throughout Canada and most of the states, anyone with an interest in nutrition can call themselves a nutritionist. There is no specific level of education or training or certification required to call yourself a nutritionist. However, for a dietitian, there is. So when you are talking to a dietitian, you know that you are going to be getting quality information that's based on sound research. Registered dietitians are nutrition specialists. They counsel and support clients to make changes in their eating habits, promote health, and prevent chronic disease. 
There are also policymakers. They'll advise government at all levels, popul um, population-wide strategies to improve the health of Canadians. They're leaders in all aspects of the food systems, including food safety and food availability, food service management, food production, and marketing. Dietitians are researchers. They'll discover new and better ways to enhance patient care, promote health, and to prevent nutrition-related disease and illness. And dietitians are educators. They'll prepare future dietitians for, uh, and other healthcare professionals for practice within the areas of nutrition. So how do you become a, a dietitian? Well, there's three steps that you need to take. First, you need to finish a degree that's focused on foods and nutrition. And here in Manitoba, that degree is called the Bachelor of Sciences focused on human nutritional sciences. And that program is offered under the Human Ecology Program. Then you need to complete a dietetic internship program. And here in Manitoba, that program is called the Manitoba Partnership Dietetic Education Program. The length of this program will vary from province to province. Here in Manitoba, it's a 10-month program where you go through different placements, each placement being three weeks long, and that will give you training in all areas. And then you have to register to practice. Now, in order to register to practice, you have to become a member of your provincial college of dietitians. And here in Manitoba, that's the Manitoba College of Dietitians. And then you have to write an exam. And that exam is called the Canadian Dietetic Registration Exam. All dietitians will write this exam on the same day at the same time. It's the same exam across Canada. Once you've passed that exam, you will become a graduate dietitian. And then after all the, the paperwork has been completed, then you are a registered dietitian. OK, so there are many different types of dietitians. And we're going to go through a few of them. And then we'll talk more specifically about community dietitian, which is what I do. So first, there's clinical dietitians. Clinical dietitians work in hospitals and other healthcare facilities. They provide nutrition therapy to patients according to their disease process. They can, this can range from fluid restrictions to low potassium diets to enteral feeding. They're also going to provide individual and group therapy and provide information to families before patients are discharged. There's long-term care dietitians. Long-term care dietitians provide services that will help meet the needs of people with chronic illness, people with di um, disabilities, or people who can no longer take care of themselves for a long period of time. Um, many patients in long-term care facilities are either malnourished or they're at increased risk for malnourishment because of things like swallowing disorders, disabilities, or other health issues. So long-term care dietitians are not only going to be working with the residents to make sure they're um, receiving the proper nutrition that they need, but they're also going to be looking at the meals that are provided in that facility to ensure that they're quality meals that will meet those, uh, those nutrient requirements as well. And then there's food service dietitians. Now, food service dietitians are responsible for large-scale food planning and services. They'll coordinate, assess, and plan food service processes in places like healthcare facilities, in school programs, prisons, cafeterias, and even in some restaurants. There's also private practice or consulting dietitians. Now, private practice dietitians will work under contract with healthcare facilities, with sports teams, with businesses, or with individuals to provide nutrition counseling. There's research dietitians. And research dietitians are mostly involved with uh, dietary-related uh, research in a clinical aspect of nutrition disease states, or in a public health aspect related to health promotion and disease prevention or in a food service aspect, and that would be issues involving the food um, prepared for patients. Many also work with biochemical aspects of nutrition interactions that are occurring within the body. And then there's um, public health and community dietitians. And public health and community dietitians will help to enhance and prevent nutrition-related disease um, health, uh, public health dietitians will focus on the interactions between the determinants of health and also between food security, um, nutritional health, and overall health. 
Okay, so let's focus a little bit more on community dietitian. My name is Amanda and I work as a community dietitian with the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Community dietitians will work with individuals, groups, and other community agencies. We'll develop and implement food and nutrition programs and also food and nutrition initiatives. We develop resources for the public and resources for professionals. We incorporate health education into community development. We'll focus on food security and on disease prevention. And we work with advocacy, policy development, and program implementation. So before I go into more detail about my job, are there any questions about the role of a dietitian? No? OK, yes? At the high school level? Um, you know, I'm not quite sure about that, which I should know, but, but I don't. Um, I know that uh, there's the human ecology program that you go into to get your bachelor's of science. It probably does require a pre-cal math, but I'm not 100% on that. And um, there are going to be a lot of courses, biochemistry, organic chemistry. Um, so you probably will need the biology and the chemistry behind that as well. Um, you'll need physiology and anatomy that you do take in university, but the biology from your high school will definitely help you with that. Anything else? Okay, we're going to talk more specifically now about my job. First, I'll give you a little overview of what I do on a daily basis, and then we'll show you some examples of my work. So um, I partner with different groups across Manitoba, such as the Alliance for the Prevention of Chronic Disease. With the Alliance for Prevention of Chronic Disease, I work with them to reduce the risk factors for chronic disease across Manitoba. Currently, we are working on advocacy for children nutrition policies and programming, and this is uh, geared to aid in the fight against childhood obesity. I partner with other organizations, such as Dairy Farmers of Manitoba, and we do this to create different resources. An example of a resource that we have created is called Kids in the Kitchen. And this is a manual for a kids' cooking club that can be used across Manitoba. Another resource that we recently developed together is called the DASH Diet Handout for doctors and pharmacists to give to patients. DASH Diet sounds for Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. Um, at the Heart and Stroke Foundation, we also develop specific resources and posters, magnets, etc. And these are resources that will meet the information needs that have been identified by communities. For example, sodium has been a hot topic over the past few years now. And so here I have an example of a sodium poster that we have developed in the past. And we actually just recently um, finished developing a sodium display board, which is quite a bit larger, showing the different sodium levels of different foods. My coworkers and myself have created a Helping Kids Live Well and a Helping Youth Live Well presentation. So we spend a lot of our time going into schools across Winnipeg and Manitoba. And this presentation discusses the importance of making healthy food choices, of being smoke free, and of being physically active more often. I also give presentations to businesses and community groups on different topics such as escaping the fast food culture or the sodium solution. I work with local nutrition and community professionals, including Winnipeg Harvest, to address the issue of food security and access to food for all Manitobans. We work with practicum students from the U of M who do food sampling and education with, uh, with the food banks. And last year we had our practicum students doing that Kids in the Kitchen program that I talked about earlier with different areas in the inner city, youth centers and drop-in centers. Okay, a few other things I do. We do TV appearances on the morning shows, uh, CTV morning and breakfast television. Um, me or my, my coworker, my other nutrition manager, will go onto that show and do two, about three to four minute segments. Usually in the first segment, we'll talk about a hot nutrition topic, and then in the second segment, we'll uh, do a recipe demonstration. For example, just um, on Tuesday, I was on breakfast television talking about the importance of fruits and vegetables. We know that um, the more fruits and vegetables people consume, then the less likely you are to have risk factors for chronic disease, such as heart disease and stroke. 
An interesting fact for your age group is that only 4% of Manitoba youth between the age of 12 to 18 are consuming enough fruits and vegetables. So that means 96% of you and your peers are at risk for malnutrition because you're not getting enough of those fruits and veggies. Just an aside there. Um, March is Nutrition Month, which just finished, and so every Nutrition Month, the Hardin Stroke Foundation works hard to get out an important nutrition message. This year we were focused on get to know your kitchen, uh, the importance of making heart-healthy meals at home. We make an, a cookbook every year, and I've handed one out to everyone when you came in. If you didn't get it, you can come and talk to me. So every year we work with the Manitoba Canola Growers Association to develop heart-healthy recipes in the Quick and Healthy Cookbook. We then produce um, four 10-minute cooking segments, which are aired on Shaw and Westman. And this year we also produced a commercial that was aired on CTV promoting um, these recipes, this cookbook, and the benefits of cooking at home with your family. I also respond to media questions and I do interviews as appropriate. I work with our communications team at the Heart and Stroke Foundation to create newspaper ads and radio ads that promote nutrition messaging. And I get calls from both the public and healthcare professionals on a variety of nutrition topics. So if ever you have any questions related to nutrition and heart disease or stroke, you can always feel free to call the Heart and Stroke Foundation and you'll talk to um, a registered dietitian, myself or my coworker, and we can answer those questions for you. Okay, so here I have a quick example of what I did. This is actually my first ever breakfast television segment from a few years ago. So you, you might be able to tell I was a little bit nervous, but we'll have a look. My guest is Amanda Nash, joining us from the Heart and Stroke. We're looking at the dangers of sodium. So first off, what's the problem with sodium? Sodium increases your risk for, for high blood pressure or hypertension. Okay. And we know that hypertension is one of the major risk factors for heart disease and stroke. Um, sodium also can have a whole bunch of other negative side effects. It can lead to increased risk for things like stomach cancer, for osteoporosis, even for things like asthma. Oh wow, so bad, 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 and bad, but most of it isn't coming out of the shaker. This is usually not people's problem. About, about 20, sorry, about 12% of our salt intake comes from the salt shaker. Which isn't a lot. So it's not a lot. Um, a good place to start would be to remove the salt shaker from the table or to try experimenting with different things when you're cooking. Easy way to drop 12% right there. Exactly. But, but it's in a lot of places that I don't quite realize, or exactly. the most of them may not realize. 77% um, of our salt intake is going to be coming from the convenience foods, processed foods, restaurant foods. Okay, so some of the stuff out the front there, these ones, even though it's designed and packaged for kids? Exactly. Even those little lunch boxes for kids can have quite a bit of sodium. 50% to 60% of your sodium can come from one of those small little packages. Wow. Okay, now some of these aren't going to be surprising. The potato chip, the pickle, those things that actually taste salty. Those are things that you think about when you, when you think about sodium. And that was a very good point. They taste salty. A lot of other things that don't taste salty can have a lot of sodium. For example, that pudding cup over there. Okay. The sugar in the pudding cup is going to mask the, the salt that's in there. But there's about 15% of your sodium intake in just that pudding cup. That's a whole lot. And this is going into my kid who get, should be getting a whole lot less sodium. Exactly. Okay, how about one of the ones, a uh, traditional condiment on my table, the hot sauce. Hot sauce, um, you want to look at the label for something like that. A lot of condiments have sodium in them. So looking at the label, this one has 8% for just one teaspoon. Ooh. So that can really add up quite quickly on something that you're adding to your actual food, which already might contain some sodium as well. And when I'm reading those labels and I'm checking those labels, you're saying it's the, it's the percentages on the far right side that I want to keep my eyes on. For sodium percentages, is a good thing to look at because it makes it a little bit easier. Looking at the milligrams can get quite large because the maximum amount of sodium that you want per day is 2,300 milligrams. Okay. And that's the maximum amount before you will have any negative health consequences. The actual amount that your body needs is only 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams. Which but isn't a lot at all. Not a lot. Um, to put it in perspective, 2,300 milligrams is just one teaspoon. Sorry, 
Yeah, one teaspoon. <laughs> one teaspoon, that's all it takes. So we, we eliminate that, and instead we look at some different ways to spice things up, some different ways to flavor, and we cut down on that sodium. Also, when it comes to our recipes, we want to keep that in mind. So you've got one for us later on in the show? We do. Later on, we're going to be making a special soup. And this soup has barley, it has lentils, it's going to be very healthy, low in sodium compared to the canned or the powdered soups that you can buy in the store. Some excellent ideas coming up on BT. Plus, we're going to save you some time. We've got time-saving tips to get you through your day. Okay, so that was just an example of um, a segment that I have done in the past on Breakfast Television Morning Show. So now I'm going to test you guys. I talked a little bit about sodium in, or a lot about sodium in that segment. So I, my question for you is, where does the majority of the sodium intake in our diet come from? Is it A, the salt shaker, or sorry, A, the salt shaker on the table, B, salt added while you're cooking, or C, restaurant and processed foods? Okay, that was very good. I heard it coming up from the front here. First of all, you should go try to have some measures to your table. Oh, thank you. You're right, it's C. So next time, let's put hands up, and then I can give out the prizes a little bit better. So you're right, the answer is C. So when we look at where sodium is coming from in our diet, 77% is coming from restaurant, processed, and convenience foods. And unfortunately, with the way that our lifestyles have come over the past few years, that tends to be a lot of our food choices instead of making fresh, natural foods at home. Um, sorry, I, I thought I had another si slide there about sodium, but we'll just back up and I'll still talk about sodium a little bit for you guys. 85% of Canadians consume more than the upper tolerable limit. And I mentioned earlier in that, in that segment we just watched, that upper tolerable limit is set at 2,300 milligrams. So that means that 85% of us are having way too much sodium, which puts our bodies at risk for adverse health consequences. Now the main consequence that I talk about with my daily work is high blood pressure, because I work for the Heart and Stroke Foundation, but there's also a lot, of, a lot of other negative health consequences to having too much sodium in your diet. And this isn't something that only affects older adults, this affects everybody, especially when we look at children and youth, because we're seeing risk factors for heart disease younger and younger and younger. High blood pressure or hypertension, which is, is um, caused for a few different reasons, one of being the high sodium intake is being seen in younger and younger kids than we've seen before. So we're starting to see school-aged kids, elementary school-aged kids developing high blood pressure. And that's something we've never seen before. In fact, there was a research article that was released about maybe four or five months ago that showed that we're seeing plaque formation in the arteries of teenagers. And this is the first time ever that we've seen that happen. Plaque formation is caused from um, lack of physical activity, from unhealthy fats in the diet, from not enough fruits and vegetables in your diet, and then from uh, other uh, negative health things like smoking as well. So we're seeing these risk factors in people your age, which means that healthy nutrition to prevent chronic disease like heart and stroke is not something that you only think about when you're an old person. It's something that we need to be thinking about as children and youth as well, and taking steps to prevent. Because if we're already seeing risk factors in teenagers, that means that we're gonna be starting to see strokes and heart attacks in young adults. Okay, that brings me into my next slide. So when we're looking at heart disease and stroke, but also overall health and chronic disease prevention, there are three things that we really need to reinforce. One is decreasing your sodium intake. Two is going to be decreasing your overall fat intake, especially when we're looking at saturated and trans fats. Saturated fats are fats that come from an animal source, and trans fats are the man-made fats, the industrially made fats. And then choosing healthier fats, which would be the unsaturated fats, which come from plant sources. So things like vegetable oils, nuts, seeds, um, and then also some cold water fish. Those are the good sources of fat. And then also increasing your fiber. So fiber comes from whole grain products, it comes from beans, legumes, fruits, and veggies. The more of those that we have, the more fiber we'll have in our diet. About 50% of Canadians are not meeting their fiber recommendations. So choosing more higher fiber foods more often is gonna be very beneficial, 
not only for disease prevention, but also for weight maintenance. Because when you eat a diet that's higher in fiber, you're gonna feel full for longer. It slows down the digestion, the food is staying in your stomach longer. That also means that you're gonna have better blood sugar control because the food, the food is digested slower, which means nutrients are released slower into your blood and your body can better manage those nutrients and get them where they need to go. So many benefits to having more fiber in your diet for all ages. Now the scary thing is that fast foods and convenience foods that we're choosing more and more often are high in fat, the unhealthy fats, they're high in sodium, and they're also generally low in fiber. So those are very negative things that we wanna try and get less of. Okay, let's, um, let's, speaking of fast foods and convenience foods, let's look at a few of those foods more specifically. Okay, so a big nutrition trend over the past few years within the food industry has been to increase portion size. And it's gotten to the fact that when you're out in the grocery store, when you're out in the restaurant, when you see food in the media, we're seeing such large portion sizes, we're consuming more portion sizes, and we've lost reality with what an appropriate portion size actually is. So let's look at a few common foods and discuss them a little bit more. So here I have a store-bought muffin. And that store-bought or restaurant muffin has about 330 calories. Now generally when you eat a muffin, it's gonna be a snack that you're having. Snacks are very good things. Three meals, two snacks a day is optimum for most people. But when you're looking at a snack, you wanna have about 100 to 200 calories in your snack. So right off the bat here, we have quite a, lot, quite a lot of calories in this muffin. So what's the better choice? If you're gonna be going out to the Tim Hortons or going out to the grocery store and buying a muffin, maybe split that muffin. Ideally, a third of that muffin is going to be a proper portion size. The best bet is going to be to make that muffin at home where you control the ingredients and you control the portion size. That way you can use some whole wheat flour, get some fiber in there, maybe add some dried fruit or nut. You can also use less fat. You can replace some of the fat with um, applesauce or yogurt, which will give it some nice moisture without the fat content. And it's still gonna taste great. It'll taste the same in the end. So making it at home, you have a variety in different ways to make it healthier for you. So I have another question. Um, for you, how, um, and I think I actually just answered the question on here, but how big do you think a regular muffin is, a standard muffin portion size according to Health Canada? Any guesses? Go ahead. So one third of that muffin. And one third of that muffin is actually going to be 55 grams. So say we went to um, Tim Hortons and we got a muffin from Tim Hortons. That average muffin at Tim Hortons is 130 grams. That's how much it's going to weigh. One third of that, it's actually approximately 55 grams. 55 grams is going to be the standard portion size for a muffin. Okay, so now before we go and talk about our fast food chicken sandwich, I'll, ha I'll ask you guys another question. How much fat do you think is in this deep fried fast food chicken sandwich? Hands up, any guesses? Yeah. 15 grams. And I actually, I don't have an amount because it's gonna vary from, from source to source, but it's actually going to be more than 10 grams. So 15 grams is a great guess. There's more saturated fat than you need for an entire day in just one of these sandwiches. Now remember I asked for saturated fat specifically, not total fat. So that fast food sandwich is going to have quite a bit of fat. Um, and remember, saturated fat is the bad fat, the fat that we actually want to limit. So bigger isn't always better when it comes to sandwiches. The average chicken sandwich that you get out at a restaurant, it's going to be deep fried. It's going to be served on a white bun. It's going to have mayonnaise and other condiments. So you're not going to be getting any nutrition from that. Health Canada reports that an average sandwich should weigh 140 grams. But when we look at the typical fast food sandwich, they're gonna be weighing quite a bit more than that, almost double that. 
It's also going to clock in with over 500 calories. So that's quite a bit of calories. That's enough for a whole meal in just your sandwich. Okay, let's look at two more items. So we, here we have the dry noodle package. So this is something like a Lipton's sidekick. My question for you is how much is one serving of pasta? Any guesses? Yeah? Great, that's right, half a cup. So I'll walk over and give this to you at the end just so we can get through everything. So half a cup is considered a serving of pasta. If you took um, a sidekick, a Lipton sidekick, and you made that pasta, it's going to make about two cups of pasta. So in that sidekicks alone, we now have four servings of pasta. So that's going to be a lot of pasta at one time. In general, when we're looking at all starches, pasta is, is considered a starch, it should be about a quarter of your plate, not the entire plate. And with pasta, that's an area where we often think pasta meal, fill the plate up with pasta. Another example is if we go out to the restaurant, and often a serving of pasta at a restaurant can have about four cups. So that's eight servings of pasta in just one portion. It's also going to have about 24 grams of saturated fat and about 1,200 calories. So we're looking at almost your day's worth of calories and way more fat than you need in one serving of pasta out at the restaurant. So what can we do? Well, we can make our own pasta at home using a whole grain pasta, and we can also control what kind of sauces we add to that. Let's add lots of vegetables, maybe some beans and legumes to get a healthy protein in there and then choosing an oil-based sauce over the cream-based sauce or a tomato-based sauce is going to help us to control the fat content. And the last one is, what beverage do you think is the best beverage for you? Any guesses? I saw lots of hands, we'll go over here this time. Water, water is the best way to quench your thirst. Your body is made up of, of mainly water. Your body needs water for so many different reasons. Um, the role of water in our body is to cool the body, to help with your digestion of food, to carry nutrients and waste around the body, and to cushion your organs and your tissues and your joints. So water has so many different roles within our body. We're constantly using the water that we have in our body, and it's so great to quench your thirst with water to replace that fluid that you need. But other sources of fluid can be good for us too. And milk is a great example. Milk's gonna offer some of those key nutrients we need, calcium and vitamin D, which are so important for our bone health, for our teeth health, and then also for our, um, for our, our arteries, our blood vessel health. So milk and water, those are two really great choices. Now have a guess here from the screen. What is the choice that I never wanna see you choose? You can yell it out. Energy drinks. Energy drinks are something that nobody actually needs. They're very high in caffeine and they're very high in sugar. When we're looking at your age group specifically, one energy drink has more caffeine than your body can handle in an entire day. So we're looking at you know, around 150 to 300 uh, milligrams of caffeine in one energy drink. Health Canada has put some regulations on that that are starting to come into effect. But even then, looking at your age group, 85 milligrams of caffeine is the maximum amount that your body can handle. When we look at people under the age of 12, 45 milligrams of caffeine is the maximum amount their body can handle. So having these energy drinks, it's toxic for you guys. It's very unhealthy because it's a lot of caffeine at once. Too much caffeine can cause irritability. It can cause um, um, rapid heartbeat. It can cause insomnia. So there's lots of negative consequences to having too much caffeine. And we know one of those energy drinks is already going to be way too much for you guys. Now the sugar. I mentioned lots of sugar in energy drinks. Now would you ever sit down and eat 15 teaspoons of sugar all at once? I, I hope the answer is no. <laughs> so if you drink an energy drink, there's about 15 teaspoons of sugar in just one of those energy drinks. So that's a lot of sugar all at once. Which brings me to sugar-sweetened beverages. So pop, beverages, punch, um, energy drinks, sports drinks, those are all gonna be sugar-sweetened beverages. Research has shown over and over and over again that consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages is directly related to obesity. So energy drinks or any sugar-sweetened beverages are something we want to limit, in the case of energy drinks, eliminate from our diet. So we have five more minutes. Um, so the last thing I really wanted to touch upon you specifically because of your age group is advertising. 
When we look at food advertisements, how often do we see food advertisements for healthy foods? There's two examples up here. There's an ad for baby carrots and an ad for, for milk. But do you see those very often? You see milk a lot? What else do we see out there for food advertisements? Candy, Candy pop, pardon me? Fast food. Fast food. So a lot of unhealthy things. And when we actually break it down, only 5% of food advertisements are going to be for healthy foods. So 95% of the food ads that you see, food and beverage ads that you see out there, are unhealthy choices. Even though some of them actually do look healthy and they market them to seem like they're healthy. They market it to seem like it's a good choice for you. Looking back at energy drinks, energy drinks are marketed to your age group, yet they're extremely unhealthy and toxic to your health. So these companies, these food producers, they put big money into food advertisement and to media. And they pay people big bucks. And these people know what they're doing to play on your emotions, to play with your mind a little bit, and make you make choices that are not going to be the best choices for you. So when you do look at the foods out there and you do see food advertisements, be them in magazine ads or on the TV, on the radio, in the stores, just keep that in mind that those food ads are swaying you one way, which is not going to be the best way for your health all the time. Okay, so if there's any other questions about dietitian related topics or how to become a dietitian, you can always visit the Dietitians of Canada website or the College of Dietitians of Manitoba website.